Good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started now. Welcome. I'm so glad to see you here on this chilly night, and I'm really glad the snow fell yesterday and not today. Um, tonight's program uh, is the William R. Ferrand Memorial Lecture, entitled Lake Sturgeon, Past, Present, and Future of an Ancient Fish. We'll have a panel of speakers who will each make a short presentation, which will be followed by questions and answers from you all. I'll introduce our speakers in a few minutes. For your information, we'll be video recording uh, tonight's talk. When we get to the Q&A, please use the microphone that we'll be passing around so that your questions can be heard and will be recorded. I'd like to start this evening's program by sharing that the museum has been working on a statement for our new space that acknowledges that the museum and the University of Michigan are located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, and that the University of Michigan was originally founded in 1817 thanks to land ceded by, a tr by treaty by the Anishinaabe people. We'd also like to recognize that museums such as ours emerged from colonialist practices that frequently involved taking and keeping objects from indigenous peoples without permission. There's a tendency in our culture not to talk about unfinished work. This statement must be crafted carefully with much thought and consultation. Our official statement is still taking shape. But by sharing our process tonight, we recognize that the practice of acknowledging and reconciling injustice is never finished work. So we welcome your input and your ideas as we take this forward. Tonight's program was inspired by LSA's Great Lakes theme semester. There have been an incredible number of programs going on. I wish I had time to go to more of them. Uh, we were looking for a positive story to tell with our Sturgeon exhibit and with this program. And uh, a story about the natural world of the Great Lakes where things are actually getting better. We settled on the story of the Lake Sturgeon, the largest endemic fish species in the Great Lakes, a fish with an ancient past with a long history of threats to its survival, and now with some inspiring efforts for restoration. How many of you had a chance to visit the exhibit down in the lower lobby tonight? Oh, great. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the person who developed it, Joe Hines, is here in the audience. Joe, would you wave? Right here. There you are. Thank you so much for your work. And did you enjoy the musical ensemble? Yes. That was a group called Converge, uh, a student ensemble from the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Um, they were performing a selection of works based on nature and water themes. The William R. Ferrand Memorial Lecture is an annual event celebrating Bill Ferrand, our museum director from 1993 to 2000. An endowment fund was set up when he retired, and all the people listed on the program that I hope you have contributed to it. Some have contributed repeatedly. Sadly, Bill passed away in 2011, and the lecture series became a memorial series. As you may know, endowment funds theoretically last forever, as we only spend a portion of the interest earned, and the fund continues to grow over time. So we'll continue to enjoy these Ferrand lectures for many years to come. Thank you to everyone who contributed to the fund. And additional gifts are, of course, welcome anytime. Are any of Bill's family members here? Most live out of state. We thought maybe a local member of the family might be able to come tonight. But if not, we certainly understand, um, given the weather, et cetera. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll be speaking. Each of our speakers will talk for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Matt Friedman received his Bachelor of Science in Biology and Geology from the University of Rochester in 2002, his MPhil in Zoology from the University of Cambridge in 2004, and his PhD in Evolutionary Biology from the University of Chicago in 2009. From 2009 to 2016, he was a lecturer, associate professor, and professor at the University of Oxford. 
Dr. Friedman is a vertebrate paleontologist focused on using fossils to inform our understanding of the evolution of modern biological diversity with a special emphasis on the paleontological record of fishes. Here at the University of Michigan, he is associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences and associate curator and director of the Museum of Paleontology. Karen Alofs is assistant professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability. She received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Chicago in biology, ecology, and evolution, and her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, also in ecology, evolution, and behavior, so almost the same. Assistant Professor Aleph studies how ecological concepts can be used to address conservation concerns in freshwater environments. Her recent work as a postdoctoral fellow with the National Science Foundation International Research Fellowship Program focused on the impacts of climate facilitated range expansions on lake fish communities. In addition to climate change, she is interested in understanding the effects of environmental stressors, including invasive species, habitat frag fragmentation, and habitat degradation on biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability. And Douglas W. Craven has, is the director of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians Natural Resource Department and has been in that position since 2002. He is a graduate of Western Michigan University with a double major in natural resource management and environmental studies. He is a former Great Lakes Leadership Academy board member and MSU Environmental and Natural Resource Governance Fellow, a current board member of the Great Lakes Fishery Trust, chairperson on the Village of Pelston Planning Commission, LTBB tribal citizen, father of five, a coach, and an avid outdoorsman. Thank you again for being here, and we'll begin with Matt Friedman. That's great. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, it's great to be here tonight to spend a little bit of time with you to talk about some of my favorite things, the evolutionary history of fishes, and the things we can learn from the fossil record. So, in 15 minutes, I'm gonna try and give you a whirlwind tour of hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary history. So I wanna give you a deep history of sturgeons and their close relatives. So sturgeons have long captivated a whole range of people. Um, and in the course of studies of biology, you know, some of the most famous biologists have been preoccupied by sturgeons. If we look in, for example, Origin, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, right, his famous tome, in evolutionary biology, a foundational text of, of modern biology, Darwin focuses on sturgeons as one of his examples of creatures that are so-called living fossils. He's a type example of these kinds of creatures. And so he mentions that in fresh waters of the world, we find these fishes that seem to be the last survivors of ancient groups that split off from their closest living relatives in the remote geological past. So we can sort of summarize those arguments made by Darwin in a more kind of modern form with this genealogy of modern fish diversity. So here we have the, the major branches of the fish tree of life. Here we have our sturgeons. And here we have a group called teleos. This is the group that comprises the vast majority of living fishes. From things you're familiar with, a goldfish in a fishbowl, to the tuna in your sandwich, to the salmon on your dinner plate, it's a teleost. They make up the vast majority of all living fishes. But outside that very successful teleost group, we have a variety of lineages with very deep evolutionary histories that today are represented by relatively few species in the modern fauna. So the other piece of information captured in this diagram, other than the structure of the family tree of these creatures, is the number of species alive today. And the number of species alive today is scaled to the size of these disks at the ends of the branches of the family tree. So you can see there are a lot of teleosts. To a first order approximation, all fishes are basically teleosts. You could be forgiven for saying that. Um, and not so many sturgeons and represent these other groups. So let's take a bit of a deep dive and consider what this group of sturgeons and their relatives is actually like. They belong to a group called the chondrostean fishes. Um, 
One of the wonderful things I, I tell my students is that these funny names, of course, have some meaning behind them. If you kind of come to grips with the roots, you can understand why they have these names. So here is a little sturgeon. It's been treated with a technique called clearing and staining. And what that does is it bleaches the soft tissues of a preserved specimen so that light can shine through it. And then protein-specific dyes that bind either to cartilage or bone stain those parts of the skeleton, okay? So everything shown here in red is bone tissue. Everything that's showing up here as blue is cartilage. And the name of this group to which sturgeons belong are the chondrosteans. And those, that means basically the ones that have a cartilaginous skeleton. So chondrosteus, chondrosti, chondros means cartilage. Osteon means bone. So it's their bony tissue is basically, instead of having a well ossified or mineralized skeleton, largely cartilaginous in its structure. And this is one of the major features of their anatomy that characterizes both sturgeons and their other close relatives, the paddlefishes. So although chondrosteans are represented today by relatively few species, that small number of species encompasses some really very different ways of life. And we're very fortunate here in North America to have both of these lineages of the chondrostean tree of life that live in our part of the world. So at the top, we have our sturgeons. At the bottom, we have our paddlefishes. And although we think of them as these creatures that have been unchanged for many millions of years, that's not to say that they don't have their own interesting innovations and adaptations, things they're doing out there in the world of nature to make a living. So we can think a little bit about how these animals are put together. And this is the kind of thing I do a lot of thinking about. So here is the skull of a sturgeon, right? There's just the body of a sturgeon to give you some context. One of the remarkable things about sturgeons is they have these incredible jaws, okay? Which they can effectively expel out of their face forming this tubular extension, which they use to suck up prey from the bottoms of lakes, rivers, and streams. You don't have to take my word for it. Here is a picture of a sturgeon just doing just that, having protruded its jaws out of the underside of its head to suck up something off this rocky bottom here. That's a really interesting feeding adaptation, a really remarkable thing. If we think about our own jaws, that's not something our jaws do. We as mammals have kind of boring skulls, actually. They don't have a lot of moving parts. At least they're not supposed to have a lot of moving parts ordinarily. If there are a lot of moving parts in your skull, something's gone very wrong. This, by contrast, is the skull of the other member of that chondrostean group. This is a paddlefish. And brought a prop on a museum person. So this is the skull of a paddlefish here. So we're looking at the actual um, bony skull. You can take a look at it maybe after the lecture. The striking thing is the jaws are really different. Great big mouth, huge gape, and really elaborated structures here on the bones that support the gills. And what these creatures do, they don't suck food off the bottom of rivers or lakes or, or ponds, excuse me. Instead, they will cruise through the water and they'll use this bill, which is covered with a network of electrosensory cells to detect zooplankton, so they're filter feeders. They're like the ecological analogs of whales or basking sharks, but in freshwater drainages here in North America. Okay? So they'll cruise through these murky waters and use that electrosensation. They'll detect the weak electric fields of the zooplankton they're consuming. And so there's one doing its thing. They open up their mouths. They look like jet engines, these fantastic things. If you go to the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago and it's paddlefish feeding time, it's incredible. You just see these guys cruising around and pulling out that zooplankton from the water column. But what I really want to talk to you all about is the evolutionary history of sturgeons. And so here's kind of a quaint look at uh, kind of cutting edge paleontology about two centuries ago. This is the first real attempt to depict what an ancient ecosystem might have looked like. So this is a drawing inspired by the fossils found on the south coast of England, a region called the Jurassic Coast, so named for the fossils it yields 
the better part of 200 million years old. You might have heard of stories of Mary Anning and the discovery of plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and some of these very early contributions to the disciplines of geology and paleontology. And here, like any good paleontological art, we have a series of antediluvian beasts being pretty mean to each other, so biting each other, a whole series of things happening. This particular set of rocks from the early part of the Jurassic period is best known for giant marine reptiles, the ichthyosaur and plesiosaur I mentioned. But living in these same settings were a variety of fishes in these ancient seas, including some of the first things we recognize as being close relatives of sturgeons. So here we are on the geological column back here about 200 million years ago in the middle part of the age of reptiles. And here's one of those early sturgeon relatives. So by the time we first find them in the fossil record, the close relatives of sturgeons and paddlefish already have manifest many of the features that are so conspicuous in the living forms. They show this reduction of the bony skeleton. They're modifying their jaws for interesting feeding uh, behaviors and so on. If we sort of jump forward into the Cretaceous period, we get a sense of not only the evolution of sturgeons, perhaps the evolution or non-evolution of paleontological reconstructions. Again, it's a very busy day here in the Cretaceous. Everyone has gotten together to pose for this painting. It's very convenient. Um, there, are, there are a bunch of kind of early birds and sort of garish feathered dinosaurs in front. But the real action here is, of course, in the background, these two early relatives of sturgeons. So it's in these famous fossil deposits of Jehobiota in the early Cretaceous, which yield abundant evidence of remarkable things like feathered dinosaurs, that we find the first modern representatives of the sturgeon and paddlefish group in Asia in freshwater settings. And here is the fossil of one of these creatures here, showing that beautiful skeleton with its reduced bony content. Now, I want to talk about some local U of M contributions to the study of sturgeon deep time. Now, there might be a couple of eyebrows raised by this. Here's a picture of a dinosaur skull from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, the latest Cretaceous of Montana. And you might very reasonably say, Matt, why'd you put this dinosaur skull there? Is there sort of a mix up with your slide carousel or something like that? No. Um, this is an interesting story relating to a completely unique specimen that we have in our own collections here at the University of Michigan that bears on the evolutionary history of sturgeon and their relatives. So there is, in fact, this skull of a duck-billed dinosaur. You can see it upstairs in the Museum of Natural History. It's a specimen that, that is curated by the Museum of Paleontology. And when it was discovered in the late 1930s, obviously there was a dinosaur skeleton. But the most interesting part about this fossil was, in fact, inside that dinosaur skeleton were the skeletons of several fishes, including not only a sturgeon, but also a paddlefish. Right? You know, hit the lottery in this case. So this fossil was discovered, and there are three fish inside this duck-billed dinosaur. And one of those specimens you can just show here. Maybe. There we go. This is the skull of an early paddlefish. This is that long paddle-like snout. And I brought that specimen here with me this evening. So we can put it up on the screen. So there is the original specimen. This is a kind of specimen that has a special status. This is called a holotype. This is the fossil specimen upon which the name of that ancient species is based and is the reference specimen for that species. So anyone who finds a fossil and they want to say it belongs to the same species has to make reference to this. This is the reference for that. And in this case, no one's tried to make reference to it. This is not only the holotype specimen, it's the only specimen. So this is a unique um, Michigan kind of contribution to the study of paddlefish and sturgeon history. So I'll have that up here later for people who want to get a closer look. Now, it might seem unusual to find sturgeons and paddlefishes inside the bellies of duck-billed dinosaurs. If you know, those of you who know about them or have small children like I do, you'll know that duck-billed dinosaurs eat plants. They don't eat fish. Um, 
But it's not the only duck-billed dinosaur in which a sturgeon or paddlefish has been found. They're apparently this remarkable means of preserving sturgeon and paddlefish. It's not because they're eating them, but rather because when these creatures are washed into rivers where their fossils are, where, where their, their, their bodies and skeletons are buried and entombed by sands, those are the kinds of settings where the delicate skeletons of sturgeons and paddlefishes would break apart. What seems to be happening is these are animals that are actually scavenging the inside of these dinosaurs, becoming trapped inside their body cavities, which sets up a low energy environment where their skeletons can remain preserved intact. So as a fish paleontologist, I think the most interesting reason to go out and collect the duck-billed dinosaurs, there might be a sturgeon or paddlefish inside of them. <laughs> So that gets us to sturgeons and paddlefishes in the fresh waters of North America in the late Cretaceous. And when we start talking about getting these same creatures here in our part of the world in Michigan, we've got to sort of fast forward to more recent aspects of geological and environmental history, thinking about what the world looked like maybe only 12,000 years ago before the formation of the Great Lakes as we understand it now, when this part of the world was covered by great ice sheets at the end of the last glacial maximum. And so that, I think, gives you a sense of the history of sturgeons leading up to the modern day, and we'll then pass on to our presentations about the present of sturgeons. Thanks. All right, so moving on to modern day, um, we know that freshwater fishes in general face multiple stressors, and these are often interacting stressors or cumulative stressors. They include things like habitat destruction, pollution, and species invasions, just to name a few. And here I'm showing you a map that illustrates an assessment of stress across the Great Lakes. Um, and you'll notice a couple of things about this map. Um, so, the, so first, the Great Lakes are the, the heart of the historic distribution of lake surgeon. And you'll notice that the highest areas of stress, which are in red in this figure, um, are often located near these purple areas that represent urban areas, or they're in the southern half of this region where the tan represents agricultural areas as opposed to the green forests. So if we want to understand how environmental stressors are impacting and have threatened lake sturgeon populations, we need to remember a few things about lake sturgeon. And if you paid close attention in the exhibit, you probably picked up a few of these. So here I have an illustration of the life cycle of sturgeon. And I just want to point out a few key points. So sturgeon are benthic. As Matt explained, they eat off the bottom surfaces, um, eating insects, mussels, and sometimes small fish. And they're long-lived. They can live up to 150 years. They're also late maturing, so females won't mature until they're around 25 years old. And they spawn intermittently, meaning that they lay and fertilize eggs around every two to seven years. Um, so in combination, these traits tend to make them really vulnerable to environmental change. It's also important to, re to remember that they're highly migratory. So the adults will spend most of their time living in lakes, and then they'll move into the fast-flowing rocky streams where they were born in order to spawn and produce offspring. So several of the greatest threats to lake sturgeon populations are associated with changes in these stream spawning habitats that occurred over the late 19th century to the early 20th century. And during this period, most of Michigan's forests in the Lower Peninsula were, were clear cut during an intensive logging area, era that lasted around 60 years. And here's a postcard from the Thunder Bay River. And you can imagine the impacts of the deforestation on the stream spawning habitat for sturgeon here. So as these trees were cut, 
you would have increased sedimentation, you would lose the cooling effects of shade from these trees, and you would have altered food availability for sturgeon. Here's an image from that same river, and you can imagine the impacts of the transport of these logs downstream scouring spawning habitat. Another factor that's influenced lake sturgeon populations um, during the 19th and early 20th century was the development of dams which limited access to these stream spawning habitats. Um, many of these dams, were, these dams were developed in order to provide electricity to rapidly developing communities and industry. Um, and today, we often see aggregations of spawning uh, lake, lake sturgeon just below dams. So this is an illustration of, of lake sturgeon spawning right below a dam. I think this dam is in Wisconsin. So um, Michigan has more than 2,000 dams on rivers and streams. Just on our Huron River, we have around 200 dams. And in the Great Lakes region, there are almost 7,000 dams. So each of the very small dots on this map over on the right-hand side of this slide represent a dam either in the US or in the Canada side of the Great Lakes. So sturgeon, we know, are broadcast spawners, and they prefer to spread their eggs over rock beds or reefs with crevices that serve to protect their eggs from, from predators. And the Detroit and St. Clair rivers were historically popular spawning areas for lake sturgeon, but also for walleye and for lake whitefish. Um, and sturgeon traveled to these rivers in order to spawn, to deposit, and to fertilize their eggs in these rocky areas in fast-flowing currents. But during the 19th century, the Detroit River became an increasingly important shipping route. We know this. And it remains incredibly important today for the Great Lakes region. So here's um, an etching from 1838 showing the view of Detroit across the Detroit River from Windsor. Here's an image from 1911 showing a cargo ship in front of Detroit. And by 1907, the cargo that passed through Detroit was more than what passed through London and New York combined. Just to think about the magnitude of the shipping here. So, between 1874 and 1868, 60 miles of shipping channels were created on the river, on the Detroit River, in order to facilitate the passage of larger, larger cargo ships. So on the left is a map of the Detroit River flowing into Lake Erie, and those dark blue lines are those deep water cha channels that are still used for shipping tra tra traffic today. On the right, you can see the riverbed at the time that they began to widen and deepen the 12-mile Livingstone Channel in, De in, lower in the lower Detroit River. And you can notice the shape of the original limestone bed with all of those, cre those crevices that would protect sturgeon eggs from predation. As this channel was deepened and enlarged um, for cargo ships, this involved dredging and the disposal of those dredging spoils. So, as this happened, this altered the channel morphology and the, and the flow and the, the dynamics of this river. This process removed over 46 million cubic meters of sediment and material, and it covered 4,000 hectares of the river, bottle, the river bottom with those dredge spoils. So you can understand the impacts of, of this dredging on sturgeon spawning and sturgeon populations. And just a little bit of hope, I know Doug's gonna talk more about restoration, but there, over the last 15 years, there have been several reef restoration projects in the Detroit and St. Clair rivers, creating spawning reefs um, in the system just by adding rough limestone blocks. And after they've done this, they've seen really rapid attraction of spawning lake sturgeon in the river. Pollution is another factor that's been an important stressor leading to the decline in lake sturgeons. Um, this is both historical point source solution related to industry and mun municipal pollution and the more recent nutrient runoff pollution that we recognize outside of the city of Toledo here on the right hand side. 
So the effects of pollution on habitat quality lead to effects on the survival and the growth, particularly of young fish. And finally, one more factor. So in combination with all of the other factors that I've already described, overharvest by commercial fishing led to a rapid decline of lake sturgeon. Um, in the late 1800s, lake sturgeon was one of the five most abundant species in commercial Great Lakes fishing. Um, early commercial fishing men considered sturgeon a nuisance. They would become entangled in their gill nets and destroy their nets. Um, so they would be caught in really large numbers. Sometimes they would burn piles of sturgeon along the Detroit River, along the shores of the Detroit River. And sometimes sturgeon would be used as fuel for passing ships. By the mid-1800s, they found more profitable uses for sturgeon. This includes um, eating sturgeon meat and sturgeon eggs, but also a product called isinglass, which is used for clarifying wine and beer, but created from the swim bladders of the sturgeon. So all of this led to increased harvesting of sturgeon, and um, there was a peak in the sturgeon fishery in 1885 that you can see in this orange line that represents more than five million pounds of sturgeon harvested in one year just from Lake Erie. After this peak, there was a rapid decline and a crash in lake sturgeon populations. And by the 1920s, less than 2,000 pounds a year was, was harvested from the entire Great Lakes. And in the 1960s, commercial fisheries on the US side of the Great Lakes were officially closed. So we can't really attribute the declines in lake sturgeon populations to any one of these stressors. It's often many of these stressors interacting, um, including deforestation, dams, pollution, dredging, and overharvesting. Um, and in some cases, these different factors are still continuing to, ha to hamper the recovery of lake sturgeon. By the 1970s, lake sturgeon populations were estimated to be 1% of their historic levels. And here I'm showing you a map of the distribution of lake sturgeon in US watersheds. So in green are watersheds where, where sturgeon, sturgeon are believed to currently be distributed. And in red are those areas where they're, they're, they're expected, they're possibly extirpated or have been proven to be extirpated and no longer exist. So the decline in lake sturgeon populations has led many states to consider this fish as imperiled. In Michigan, lake sturgeon are officially listed as a threatened species, while to our south, lake sturgeon are often listed as endangered. And in, in the Canadian provinces, they're often listed as threatened or as species of concern. There are 24 remaining populations of lake sturgeon in Michigan. Of these 24 populations, 12 are believed to be below the minimum po viable population size, which is estimated as 80 adults in a population. Many of these 12 have fewer than 25 individuals. Four populations are classified as small in size, having between 80 and 200 adults, and three populations are classified as medium in size, having somewhere less than 750 adults. Only five populations, which I've listed on this slide, are considered to be large in size, and three of these are considered to be abundant and stable enough to support fisheries harvest. So those, those lakes where recreational fishing is allowed for sturgeon include Black Lake, where there are more than 1,000 individuals, the St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair having more than 15,000 individuals, and the Detroit River with nearly 5,000 individuals. So before I end, I'd just like to mention two emerging and current potential threats to lake sturgeon. So first, invasive species. And in this picture, I'm showing you a picture. I'm showing you quagga mussels and round goby. So both of these would occur in the Detroit River right now. Quagga mussels have spread across the bottoms of all of the Great Lakes. Um, and round goby, which are pictured here, are this small benthic um, fish, which is a nest predator and may consume um, lake sturgeon eggs. Mussels, on the other hand, can impact both 
productivity and food availability, but interestingly, lake sturgeon have been observed eating both quagga and zebra mussels. Sea lamprey are another um, impactful invasive fish in the Great Lakes. So this fish is parasitic and it feeds on the blood of larger fish like lake trout. Sea lamprey, much like lake sturgeon, concentrate in streams in order to spawn, and this is where their juveniles occur. This is also where, since the 1960s, managers have been applying lamprecide poisons in order to control sea lamprey populations in hundreds of streams every year since the 1960s. And this has been a really remarkably effective invasive species control program. Unfortunately, lake sturgeon juveniles are also somewhat susceptible to this lamprecide, and so timing the application of this lamprecide such that it is less impactful on lake sturgeon is really important. The second effective control measure for sea lamprey has been using dams and other barriers in order to prevent the migration of sea lamprey into streams for spawning. And this means that as we consider moving, removing dams in order to improve connectivity for our native migrating fishes, that we're unfortunately also increasing the likelihood that sea lamprey will invade these streams and they, those streams then will require lamprecide treatments for control. And finally, there is some evidence that projected warming in the Great Lakes region will negatively impact um, lake sturgeon. This is because lake sturgeon are adapted to cool waters, um, and as stream waters increase in temperature past 28 to 30 degrees, these waters would become less hospitable for, sea, for, for lake sturgeon. Um, there may also be indirect effects on food resources and predation related to this climate warming. And that's where I'll end and pass the presentation on to Doug. All right, uh, thanks, Karen. Um, <clears throat> I need a G Jack and Dodum, Waganduxing Odawa Nada, Doug Craven, and Dijinakas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cultural connection of uh, sturgeon or Name uh, to Anishinaabek people here in the Great Lakes, and then a little bit about some of the restoration work, some of the things that we're doing um, in regards to sturgeon as we move forward. Uh, so I just introduced myself in Anishinaabe Moen, uh, so that's uh, the native language the, of the Ojibwe, the Boto'odami, and the Odawa. Uh, so I'm a little Travers Bay Band Odawa member. So what I did uh, is introduced, I said, Ani, that's hello, uh, Ajijek and Dodum, so I'm Crane Clan. Um, Waganuxing Oda, or Waganuxing Nada, so that's Waganuxing means uh, land of the crooked tree, so that's where I'm from. And then uh, I introduced myself, my name, Doug Craven, and is uh, my name is Doug Craven. <clears throat> so where I'm from is up in the tip of the lower peninsula. Um, that is the land of the crooked tree, that's Odawa area there. Um, Waganuxing is crooked. Ing, the I-N-G at the end there, means place of. So if you see anything, um, there's other places here in Michigan that have that kind of ing at the end that means place of. Uh, some of them are actual Anishinaabek words, Anishinaabe Moen. Uh, Ishpaming uh, means to a certain degree, uh, kind of a, a spirit land or a, a happy hunting ground type thing, if you will. Uh, and then there's some other words that were <coughs> corrupted by schoolcraft that are not really Anishinaabe words at all, just ones that you thought sounded kind of cool and, and put those into there. So <coughs> the reason why I bring that up is that a sturgeon is one of our clans. So there are seven clans that the Anishinaabe have. Uh, one of those is a fish clan, and Name, or sturgeon, is the head of that clan of that fish clan. Uh, so that's a way that we've uh, organized over, over the course of the years. Each of those clans had different types of responsibilities. Uh, so I'm a, a G-Jack. <clears throat> part of our thing that we have um, is that uh, they're part of the 
uh, leadership roles within their communities. Um, Mukwa is a bear, so that's another one of our clans. Uh, one of their roles is that they're the keepers of the medicine, uh, but they're also uh, more of the, uh, not necessarily uh, police, but <clears throat> a warrior type thing. And those kind of get mixed up with different people, meaning that they're maybe more aggressive, but really their role is keeping the peace. And so their responsibility uh, is kind of keeping the peace within the community. Uh, and then there's Sturgeon. So Sturgeon is uh, one of the oldest clans that we have. So uh, the uh, pre previous presenters really went through very well the history of them, some of the biological nature of them, uh, but they've been around for a very long time. So within our community, if you're a Sturgeon clan member, uh, then you're somebody that is sought out after for wisdom. Uh, they're, they're kind of the retain that knowledge, that long-term knowledge um, of those things. They don't make rash decisions that we can count it on uh, for counsel or, or those types of things. So that's just a little bit of a background uh, on how sturgeon uh, play into uh, Nishinaabek culture, history, uh, those types of things. So obviously we have, <clears throat> Uh, moving forward here, uh, a, a strong connection to, uh, or to Sturgeon from that cultural perspective, uh, but also there is a, a community or connection to them also in regards to um, harvest and, and those types of things. Uh, so the spring uh, was always a, a very difficult time for Anishinaabe people. Um, so it was a long winter. Uh, you have sugar bush, uh, maple syrup production is always a big component of Anishinaabe culture. Um, and then your species that typically spawned in the spring, if they're aggregated or if they're in a close proximity, uh, sturgeon, walleye, uh, those would be areas uh, that Anishinaabe would come back together. Uh, so the harvest of sturgeon, uh, the harvest of walleye, and the harvest and, um, of maple syrup uh, we're very important uh, for Anishinaabe communities uh, from a calorie type of perspective. So you went through a long winter there. Uh, you had some resources. Typically, they were caches or different things that were stored uh, from your agricultural uh, products during the summer there, corn, uh, those types of things. And then you would get to the spring, uh, you would harvest maple sugar. Um, and you'd get the calories. They're very important calories from that, but also these other activities as far as spearing. So you'd go to areas where sturgeon were known to congregate as far as uh, spawning and be able to spear those. It also brought people back together. So it was a very big car component of community. Uh, so in the winter, you were broken off into the much smaller family groups. Uh, and then these activities, maple sugar production specifically, and then going to these places uh, where sturgeon, walleye, and some of the other spring spawners uh, were located, uh, brought communities uh, together. So sturgeon is, uh, is, is very important in that regard to Anishinaabe. Um, I'm the Natural Resource Department Director at Little Traverse Bay Bands with Dawa Indians. Uh, we're up in Harper Springs, Petoskey area. Uh, we have about 30 or so uh, employees within our department. Uh, we have a Great Lakes Fisheries Program. Uh, we have an Environmental Services Program. We have an Inland Fish and Wildlife Program. We have a Conservation Enforcement Program with officers. And then we have an Administration Program. Um, within our Great Lakes program and within our, or our inland program, uh, we have a small-scale hatchery. Uh, it's kind of co-managed by both. We do some production uh, for some species that are related to the Great Lakes and then some species uh, that are related to uh, inland waters. Um, our hatchery <clears throat> is, again, it's a small-scale hatchery. Uh, it's about a $2.5 million facility there. So we're not a production uh, facility. So some of you may have been to, uh, there are several state facilities and federal facilities in, the, in uh, Michigan uh, that produce uh, rainbow trout or certain other species. Uh, they're producing high volumes of fish. Our facility is based on research and it's based on doing some smaller scale stuff. Uh, so we're doing a lot of innovative work right now in regards to Cisco. Um, and learning how to rear Cisco, so whitefish. Uh, we're doing some work right now in regards to uh, whitefish, learning how to rear those. Um, as the Great Lakes change, both of those species are really uh, in peril, and so this is one way uh, that you can help with that. In addition to that, we do rear uh, sturgeon. So we work closely with uh, the Black Lakes facility. It's an uh, MDNR RAN facility. Uh, Karen mentioned that's one of the facility or one of the areas that currently allows for a harvest of sturgeon. Uh, they're seeing some pretty decent reproduction there. Uh, one of the barriers there for, uh, for sturgeon, though, is they have an impoundment. They have a Tower Cleaver Dam. It's a, it's a 
power producing facility there uh, that just recently went through a relicensing um, and it should be around for another 50 years or so perhaps. Um, that is an impoundment, that's a barrier for a sturgeon in that, in that area there. However, it allows for the sturgeon to congregate and as a part of that, uh, MDNR with the assistance of MSU and a couple other partners including ourselves are able to collect spawn and eggs from those fish and or your uh, your fry or your smolt that kind of come out there. So you're doing a larval drift to actually collect a small um, sturgeon and then you're able to take those and rear them in the hatchery. Uh, so the benefit there is you're able to get them uh, a little bit better environment where you're have, able to have a much higher success rate uh, to get them up to a, a larger size there. So that's something that we've been partnering with uh, those guys over there. It's a, it's a collaborative facility between Michigan State and MDNR. Um, on an annual basis, we've gotten between uh, 500 to 5,000 or so sturgeon that we've been able to successfully rear up <clears throat> and get to a point where we can stock those back out into uh, Burt and Mullet Lake systems, um, which are part of the inland waterway. Uh, the Burt, Burt Lake and Mullet Lake um, are connected. They're near the Black Lake system. So these are up in Sheboygan County, uh, the tip of the lower peninsula of that area there. So we've been concentrating primarily on Burt Lake. So we have a goal of trying to get a viable population back in that system. Uh, in addition to being a significant species to us at Little Travers Bay Bands, uh, there's obviously a number of other partners that are very interested in uh, sturgeon up there. So we work closely with a group up there called Sturgeon for Tomorrow. Uh, they're based out of the uh, Black Lake area there. They're really uh, one of the key components that have led uh, the charge in getting sturgeon um, protections put in place and getting to the point where we are now where you can have a viable harvest of sturgeon at Black Lake. Um, one of the things that they've really been instr instrumental in is that, again, sturgeon, um, when they spawn, they're going to be in these smaller tributaries. Um, they can be very vulnerable. Um, from our ass perspective as uh, Little Travers Bay Bands or Anishinaabe, historically, that's where you harvested them uh, because they were easier to um, get a hold of. Um, there was more of a, an efficiency aspect when you're looking at it from a tribal perspective in terms of harvest as opposed to a thrill of the hunt type of mentality or the thrill of the chase fair game perspectives. So you would be able to access those. But in that regard, that makes them vulnerable and up into um, this uh, sturgeon for tomorrow, having a little bit more presence there, there were a lot of poaching that was happening on the Black Lake River there. And so one of the things that they did is they organized um, some groups and they call themselves the Sturgeon Guard and so they would sit along uh, the banks there during this vulnerable time and help prevent any of this poaching from happening, uh, which is just another source of mortality. So it was already imperiled uh, population there, so that was one step uh, that really helped get Black Lake Sturgeon back over to where they need to be in addition to having uh, these hatchery facilities to help it. So, for us at Little Travers Baby Ants, um, we've been working in that system now for about, uh, since 2013. Um, in total, we've been able to successfully uh, rear in our hatchery facility uh, between 200, uh, and this last year we were able to successfully rear about 1,000 sturgeon. So in, gen or in total, we've released now uh, successfully 4,000 sturgeon into um, the Black Lake, or to the Burt Lake system, primarily by putting those into sturgeon River, which is a tributary uh, to Black Lake. <clears throat> so it was mentioned earlier that there is a number of impediments that are affecting sturgeon. So this is one of the ways that you can actually help uh, get sturgeon over the hump there um, in regards to some of these things that have happened in the past, overfishing, uh, your dams, uh, some of the environmental degradation that you've had. Um, so this sturgeon rearing facility, uh, that sturgeon work that we're doing, the sturgeon work that MDNR is doing, are contributing to that, and there are several other partners now in the state that are doing some of the similar work. Um, there are several tribes now that have their own sturgeon rearing facilities, which are streamside facilities, uh, Gun Lake, uh, Band of Mashi Panashi, which are over by Kalamazoo, uh, the uh, Gun Lake area there, just south of Grand Rapids. Uh, they've been doing quite a bit of work uh, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife <clears throat> and been able to successfully have some fish reared and reintroduced into the Kalamazoo River. The Little River 
Uh, the Little River Band of uh, Ottawa in Manistee. Uh, they've been doing quite a bit of work on the Manistee River itself and the Pier Marquette. Uh, so they have a streamside rearing facility as well uh, that they've been able to successfully uh, annually stock out sturgeon. Um, so that's uh, you know some areas that we're seeing a lot of positive movement in that regard. Uh, the other thing that we, we're working on that is leaning or we think is essential as far as moving uh, restoration forward is just getting some education out there. So trying to get people, individuals uh, interested in it. Sturgeon are huge fish. Uh, they're very amenable to people and public uh, love them, like to see them, uh, but they're still pretty rare, right? So it's pretty hard to, to get up close with them. Uh, the university here, the museum here has got a great uh, exhibit on sturgeon and they actually have a live, uh, live sturgeon within that, uh, that exhibit there. And so that gives people this opportunity to interact um, with sturgeon and build those relationships such that they're gonna care for them when you move forward. Uh, so we developed a sturgeon in the classroom program. Uh, similar to uh, what some of you may be familiar that the state has had in the past, MDNR has had in the past, is a salmon in the classroom. Uh, but we've developed a sturgeon in the classroom and it's a it's a curriculum that we've developed also so we've worked with our education department uh, within the natural or within our tribe uh, to develop a curriculum uh, that you can hand off to teachers uh, so that they can use this sturgeon not only as a uh, opportunity for students to interact and not a class pet if you will uh, but actually develop some curriculum around it so they're looking at doing math they have to do a lot of calculations in regards to how much to feed the sturgeon based on how big it is is it has very demanding uh, needs in that regard when to change the filter based on how much ammonia is in there. So they're testing water quality. Uh, they're doing these components with it. And then there's also a habitat component on it uh, where they look at the challenges that sturgeon face right now and specifically impoundments and how do you get around those and those types of things. Uh, I have had opportunity to participate in a couple of those and some of the ideas that students come out, uh, come out with in regards to addressing a, a certain question specifically, uh, the impoundments can be very uh, innovative. And that's something that, you know, as you get older, we kind of get into a, a box and think of there's only a few solutions based on what we've based our, what we've learned up until this point. Uh, so they really had some really innovative uh, ideas Ideas from catapults to um, to vacuum type systems to a few other things, uh, but a few of the th ideas that they came up with are actually starting to be used and have been used on the Fox River, um, and that's one of the ones that uh, was being mentioned over in Wisconsin, uh, where there is a modified ladder and the sturgeon and or fish that need passage will swim into it and then it triggers an elevator and it lifts them up to the top and then they go over uh, over the dam there. Uh, so, you know, these are some ideas that some of these students, you know, we're really looking at and it's, nice, it's interesting to see that they're being utilized or some other people are kind of taking them on. Uh, but one of the things that we really thought was uh, was great about that is that's a way for us to get some uh, connection. You know, really reach out to those those students. We have about uh, six uh, or six schools now that are uh, participating in it. Uh, we've targeted uh, the middle or the. Um, ninth grade, so your early high school level for that, uh, that curriculum that we've developed specifically for those guys. Uh, but we've had some teachers now uh, that are in different or different age groups uh, that expressed interest, and so we're looking to work with them as well. Uh, you really need that teacher that's going to be passionate about it. There's a lot of work that needs to be involved uh, with it, but we think that it's important to, to open that up. In addition to that, for the local schools that we have as part of this program, uh, since our facility is doing some of this, uh, we mirror that into it as well. So those students then, uh, they come out to our hatchery, um, they see our fish, they help select their fish that they're going to take back uh, to their school. Uh, we provide them the tank, we provide them uh, all the materials, we provide them filter, we provide them the food, so they're gonna be eating bloodworms. There's a certain cost to that. Uh, we store those, we provide those to those guys. We walk through the process with them and getting it set up. And then we have another visit for them to come back out to our hatchery mid-year. Um, they keep, they get them in September, they keep them all year long. And then in April, uh, we take their fish and we go to Sturgeon River and then we release them. Uh, but as a part of that, we also have a cultural uh, activity for them. So we'll bring in one of our pipe carriers uh, and he'll talk a little bit about the cultural significance of sturgeon. Um, if, uh, the importance of it. We have our biologists there as well, and they talk a little bit about the, you know, the biology of it, and then they get to participate in, in that as well, and they release that sturgeon back uh, into the river. 
In addition to that, for us, the sturgeon that we rear, uh, we rear those uh, on an annual basis as well. And we keep them a little bit longer than the sturgeon that the, the kids have there. So we'll release, do our release in August. And when we're releasing our fish in August, we do the same thing. We have a ceremony uh, for the community. Uh, we have kind of a potluck. We'll cook some hot dogs and that type of thing. Uh, and we'll bring in a, a pipe carrier again. We'll talk a little bit about it. And then we allow people in the community, and it's not just tribal members, but anybody that's in the community uh, to come to that event and then have some hands on. They get to you know, touch the sturgeon. They get to release the sturgeon. They can put it in the water, and they can see it uh, kind of uh, swim out there. So for us, I think you know, those are important components there, not only doing the work, um, which there's a lot of great work that's being done right now as far as restoration, uh, stocking, those types of things, uh, but trying to help spread uh, that interest in there and really targeting uh, the, you know, those next generations that may not have the opportunity to interact with those uh, so you can kind of get them involved and concerned about that uh, and get them interested, you know, pursuing natural resources. Uh, we need new biologists, future biologists, those types of things. Uh, so for us, that those programs have been uh, really successful. Um, I really didn't get a chance to touch on a lot of the other work that's being done out there. Uh, there are some significant impediments still that we're really faced with. Um, you know, the uh, dams and those types of things, that's one of them. But it's invasive species and it's going to be climate change. You know, and those are the, the big, big things that I think are really kind of uh, keeping us from moving forward on that. Uh, the Great Lakes in general, Right now, specifically the upper lakes, uh, they are nutrient deficient because of uh, your quagga mussels and the filtering out of that. Uh, many people come up to our neck of the woods now and they look out and the water looks pristine. It looks like the Caribbean, it's beautiful, um, but it you shouldn't look like that. You can get a glass of water out of the lake and it looks just like that. Uh, that's not a healthy system. There's not enough nutrients in that system for these other species. Um, and that's not only going to affect lake trout or uh, sturgeon, but lake trout, whitefish, and these other species uh, as well. So that's going to be a big, big challenge for us moving forward. Uh, but on our in, in, inland systems, I, I think we are seeing a lot of progress in some of your other productive areas, uh, Lake St. Clair, um, some of these lower systems, uh, you're seeing a lot of progress down there as well. Well, I'll invite our speakers to head up the secret ramp to the table up there. And we've got some museum staff in the back who have some really cool microphones that are inside of cubes. Lori's holding one up there. So if anyone has a question, you can put up your hand, and Lori or Jade will give you the microphone, and you can ask you can your question. Toss them to other people. Yeah. First I was question. just wondering, is it on? Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering, during your talk, you talked about the lampreys, and I was wondering if a fish ladder around the dam allow the fish to go up, but would prevent the lampreys from going up? I don't, I don't know. I'm not. Um, do you know much about ladders? So uh, lamprey, yeah, if you're going to have an impoundment barrier for lamprey, you really need to have a, a, a lip on it so they can suction their way up. So some of, the, um, some of the problems with fish ladders, if there's not enough velocity that goes through that, or if you don't have a little bit of a lip, uh, that can be a way for sea lamprey to get up. As we're removing some of these impoundments, the idea is that they that that is the best barrier so your most lower barrier on your system is going to be the best effective barrier against sea lamprey uh, but there are some ideas out there looking at different technologies so maybe some velocity type things but also some of these temporary barriers that maybe you have a barrier that's only there when the when the uh, lamprey are spawning and then it's lowered or it's not there uh, when you have these other species that want to go up through there and use that so we really need to kind of look at these other ideas. Um, there is uh, often too much of a reliance on lampricide. Uh, there are some ideas or some evidence out there that some of the lampricide is losing its effectiveness over time. So it is a very specific uh, poison, if you will, chemical uh, that you know affects lamprey. But over time, it's starting to lose some of its effectiveness too. So we really need to look at these other options uh, long term for lamprey. Another question. I really just wanted to hold the cube. No, uh, my question's for Matt, and um, I just want to know: Are there other examples of, um, I guess, 
paleontological bycatch similar to the sturgeon story you told us about the duckbill dinosaurs? Of, of, you mean of finding, finding fossils and other fossils you wouldn't find otherwise? Yeah. There are, um, so finding gut contents in fossil fishes is not unusual. Um, but I don't know of many examples where the specimen inside that other, that other animal is unique. <clears throat> the one counterexample I can think of to that is there's actually a cast in the museum here of a small dinosaur called Compsignathus from Solenhofen, um, this famous deposit in Germany that yields Archaeopteryx, famously the sort of first bird. Um, <clears throat> and inside the gut of that dinosaur is a small reptile related to today's tuatara, which is actually designated as a holotype. So this, the, the gut contents were described as unique species. So it does happen from time to time, but it is, is definitely the exception rather than the rule. I had a question about the Burt Lake reintroduction. If the fish is gonna take 25 years or so to mature, about how long do you think it'll be until you can get that viable population? So there is still a remnant a population in there. So we're looking at doing the stocking as a way to kind of augment that. So one of the things that you really need to do is get out and do an assessment to get a better idea of what kind of population you have there currently, um, get a better idea of what your success um, has been from those stocking events. So we did a uh, assessment on Burt Lake in 2015, um, we're looking at doing another one uh, this year. So we're going to be looking at some recruitment in the in the fall, specifically uh, to see how those fish that we have been stocking, um, they're getting to the size now where we should be able to pick those up in some gill nets um, um, and be able to take a look at those. In addition to the adults, uh, when we did the survey uh, in 2015, uh, we had we got a few adults, uh, but not enough to really do a, an adequate uh, population estimate in that regard. <clears throat> I guess. <laughs> With such a long-lived animal, I'm wondering uh, if anybody knows much about their behavior and intelligence, and particularly uh, for those that might be over 100 years old, have they learned how to deal with some of the threats that, Car that Karen and Doug have mentioned? <laughs> I am not familiar with any behavioral or intelligence, I mean, intelligence studies. Um, I mean, there, I did mention that there, they have been seen consuming dracinid zebra and quagga mussels, and that maybe is an adaptation to this, this new novel food resource um, that you could think of as some kind of, um, modification of their behavior. Although mussels are part, the native mussels are a part of their diet, um, the dracinids are somewhat different. The MSU facility, MDNR facility at Black Lake there, uh, they, they do a variety of different experiments there, uh, specifically in regards to habitat preference, <clears throat> uh, those types of things. So they do see some differences on where they would where they choose to be, specifically when they're at those younger ages. <clears throat> I think there may have been a a picture or two, but they're very camo kind of oriented. So your adults are much more monocolor, uh, but at your smaller sizes, they have a lot of blotted patterns. And so there were some differences that they were seeing between what kind of camo they had and what kind of habitat substrate they were in. So there was some awareness that they thought of, you know, what they what they looked like. Um, but they're they're doing they do they're doing quite a bit of work right there. But as far as you know, adaptive learning or those types of things. Um, it could be, it's interesting. I, I did read something about um, where there's a lack of appropriate, I guess my mic is not <coughs> anymore. It should be on now. Okay. Um, I did read something about um, where there was a lack of appropriate substrate for spawning in the Detroit River that they did observe spawning and find eggs in the midst of debris, construction debris, coal, anything that had been dumped in the river that would provide those crevices. Now, the success of those eggs once they're laid is certainly probably not as high as in a natural substrate, but they were able to find some place to lay their eggs. I saw someone way over there with a yellow cube. Yeah, hey. Um, 
This introduction of new fishes into the river by the school children seems like a really great moment to tag them so that if you get them again, you can actually know what individual they are. Is that something that you're planning on doing? Uh, it might not be a thing for active populations, but it might be something for the introduction. Yeah, so for all the fish that we release, including the ones that are um, in the sturgeon and classroom program, uh, they do all have pit tags. <clears throat> So they're, they're, they're all tagged, yes. And I think there's an example of those pit tags in the exhibit downstairs, is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't see where Anybody I see. else? Oh, there's someone in the back. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about water temperatures um, in a warming climate and um, since they uh, both live in lakes and they spawn in rivers. Um, and rivers are generally going to be cooler waters and lakes are going to be warmer. I don't know. Um, yeah, so, so what is the relationship between these two? Like, what's the, um, what's the doomsday temperature that we're looking at? What, what right. temperature do they need so, to have in a river to spawn and in a lake to live? It's a good question. So from there's one study from Wisconsin River specifically looking at what habitat would be lost as temperature increases. And they identified that um, 28 to 30 degrees Celsius as kind of a threshold. So, so sturgeon are adapted to cool waters. Within Michigan, we have fish that are warm water adapted like a bass, cool water adapted like a sturgeon or a walleye, or cold water adapted like a trout. And Michigan rivers are, uh, um, a little bit complicated to predict their temperatures because it depends on the amount of groundwater discharge that's going into that river. That might keep it a very cold despite climate warming. Um, and, but many rivers will be, will be affected by climate warming as they have less groundwater discharge. Um, so th the idea is that sturgeon will probably be more vulnerable to changes in those stream spawning habitats because there's less opportunity to find cold water refuge. Um, whereas deeper lakes, the deeper you go past the thermocline, there's, there's colder water available for them to escape warmer waters. But if you need to pass through an area that's too warm in order to reach your spawning habitat, um, then that could certainly limit your ability to spawn. Thank you. I saw a question right at the very back, sir. <coughs> Further back. back here. Did you have your hand up all the way back? No, OK. Uh, right here. Uh, Doug, you mentioned, uh, or what I heard you say, a pipe carrier during your ceremonies. I'd love to know what that's all about. Yeah, so that is a, a term of a, a person that's in our community that holds a lot of culture, a lot of knowledge. Some people may have referred to him as a medicine man type of person, uh, but there's people in our community uh, that have a lot of knowledge um, that their responsibility is to carry on some traditions, uh, know stories, uh, know a lot of traditional ecological knowledge about certain species. Um, so we have one of our pipe carriers in our community is a Sturgeon Clan uh, person. Uh, so that's one of his responsive. So that's one of his responsibilities uh, also is to you know participate and do those types of things. Um, and so then, yeah, uh, it, it's an actual ceremony. He'll have a, his pipe. He has a bundle. Within that bundle, there's a lot of sacred items. Uh, there's different uh, protocol that he kind of goes through. Um, sometimes there's a tribal member that'll assist him or somebody that's learning will, that'll assist him or those types of things. Um, but then he'll talk a little bit about maybe some teachings uh, that have come out of sturgeon or related to sturgeon. Uh, those types of things. There's several stories uh, that we have, <clears throat> teachings, maybe a parabola, that type of thing that people are aware of um, that have those. And coincidentally, uh, this time of year <clears throat> is the storytelling <clears throat> portion of our year, so they're not really supposed to share certain information or have stories until there's snow on the ground, and that's typically when our communities uh, you know, were smaller, but that's when they would come together to have a storytelling event or those types of things. Back. There's a question at the very back of the room. Um, Jay? Oh. Are sturgeon compatible with Asian carp, or are Asian carp a threat to uh, sturgeon if they should get into the Great Lakes? I would definitely expect that Asian carp would be a threat to sturgeon in the Great Lakes. Um, feed, so there's potentially four different species of, of Asian carp that could be 
um, introduced into the Great Lakes or make their way into the Great Lakes. They'll be feeding um, on plankton, vegetation, and also their, the black carp in particular is a molluscivore, and so it's a, it's a benthic feeder, much like lake surgeon. So they'll be competing for those food resources. Right here. Well, has the uh, use of uh, pheromone research being done up in Hammond Bay having any impact on the lessening of lampreside needed? That's a, a, an excellent question. So the idea with pheromones is that they can um, attract lamprey to um, traps, generally, is how they use them, or they may use them to attract or to repel chemical cues to repel lamprey from streams that they want to pr protect. Um, there, there is some evidence that it's working, but the amount of lamprey that they're able to trap is really limited in comparison to the number of lamprey that they can kill with lampricide so far. But this is an area of really active research, I would say. And there are several other um, methods that they're still testing um, f for controlling lamprey um, barriers lampricides, pheromones are a really active area of research. You know anything more? No. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> another area that the, I think is interesting, uh, it looks like there's some evidence that it might work, is kind of a uh, like a necrocide type of thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that they found that uh, lamprey don't like to go where other dead lamprey are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that if you makes sense, right? So if you have a, a way of kind of capturing that essence, if you will, uh, then you might be able to put that into a system and that the lamprey will avoid going into that system based on the idea that they think there's lamprey that are dead in that system. <clears throat> Why don't we have um, one more question? It's starting to get a little late and we can, if there is another question, we would be happy to take it. Somebody just wants to catch this? <laughs> <laughs> I have one more, I guess. Um, what impact uh, is the, there's still a commercial fishery on, on sturgeon, uh, particularly in Canada. What impact is that having on the populations? Um, I haven't, I, I couldn't tell you the exact numbers off the top of my head. I think that part of the challenge is that there isn't good data available on it. Yeah, I, I'm not really aware of what their harvest is or what kind of impact it is right now. There, I mean, there is still commercial harvest in Canada. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers very much and thank all of you for coming tonight.